Good morning, everybody, and I'd like to thank the organizers of that seminar series for giving me the opportunity to share with you a few thoughts and uh, uh, also results in an uh, emerging field of uh, organic semiconductors for optoelectronics. Now, when I first received the invitation and I saw this was a seminar series on advanced fabrication, I thought, well, I'm probably the least qualified person to uh, speak to students or people who are uh, daily going into the lab or in the clean room and uh, uh, doing research and, 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 and dealing with uh, a very complex fabrication. I uh, haven't done any fabrication in the past uh, 20 years. My students do. Um, so I thought, well, what is it that I could share with you that would still be very useful and thi things I really care about, which I think um, are important and that, that you, should, you should consider when you, when you step in, in the lab, okay? And so what I'd like to do is first share with you a few thoughts about um, innovation and why innovation uh, is, uh, has always been so important, but uh, I think becomes even more important as, as, as we, move, uh, we move forward. And, uh, you know, innovation is, is we need it because uh, it's a way of uh, sustaining our economies to uh, generate uh, a value, uh, not just uh, economic value, but social value, uh, some wealth, maintain our, the, 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 the standard of living that uh, we enjoy right now. And uh, if you look back at innovation, you know, sometimes it comes at you really fast. And uh, I like that picture because it kind of illustrates, you know, how uh, innovation can really almost retire uh, some legacy technology and then uh, open up a comp completely new era with, uh, with new challenges and, 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 and new opportunities. So innovation is here and uh, you can classify innovation in two major types and uh, here I'm just kind of uh, repeating or uh, translating some of the thoughts that uh, Clay Christensen um, described in his book, uh, The Innovator's Dilemma, where he kind of studied the evolution of uh, storage devices and storage markets. And, um, you know, he found that there are really two main classes of innovations. There is so-called uh, sustaining innovation, where you make some small but important incremental improvements over uh, existing products. Um, we experience that currently by, you know, we, we keep our cell phones uh, <laughs> during a period that gets shorter and shorter because it has more gadgets and more uh, speed and, and more capabilities and, and so on. And uh, so that's the, the sustaining innovation. But as illustrated by uh, the previous picture, more importantly, they're also disruptive innovations, the ones that you don't really see coming at the beginning because um, initially, they, uh, they cover very small markets. And so the main players in any uh, market or technology field don't really pay much attention to these disruptive technologies, and, and you shouldn't. Because uh, if you're a billion dollar company and you want to increase your sales, um, your return by 20% every year, you need to add uh, $200 million of uh, new uh, sales uh, um, um, every year and so you can't do this if you start to look at disruptive uh, innovations that uh, still uh, correspond to, to very small markets. Okay? However, as uh, Clay Christensen described very, very well in his book and as shown in the storage uh, uh, market uh, and area is that these disruptive technologies, they can grow very fast. They grow much faster than the sustaining innovations, and then at some point, they can take over and uh, the legacy technology can just disappear because of these uh, disruptive uh, technologies, okay? Now, why is innovation also important? And why I think as we move forward, they will become uh, even more important? Because if you look at some of the global trends right now, uh, which are driven in part uh, with a significant increase in population. You know, we are nowadays uh, over 7 billion people on the planet. Uh, 
When I grew up at school, I learned we were four billion. <laughs> uh, seven from four within you know, just a few decades is, is really impressive. And, and if you look at the projections, this will continue to grow to uh, really impressive numbers. And uh, with that population growth, there are a lot of new challenges. Energy, energy demands, and so, uh, you know, um, a lot of other, uh, of course, important aspects. We have to find solutions to that growing energy demand while also making sure that we don't deplete some of the other key resources such as food and, and water, for instance. Also make sure that we, we develop some technology so that healthcare can, can, can remain or become more affordable and, and so on. And of course, make sure that uh, all of this um, uh, is done in a way where uh, we don't uh, really impact too much uh, the environment. And so, you know, when you look at that broader context and you look at these trends, these evolutionary trends, you can ask yourself if, for instance, the efforts that are ongoing in uh, generating renewable energy sources, if sustaining innovations are actually enough, or if we really need to uh, focus on uh, disruptive uh, innovations. Okay, so I think there's a really need for disruptive uh, innovations. And so innovation means many things. It means different things to different people. There are many definitions, but in first approximation, you could say, okay, it's a process by which you transform uh, inventions and ideas into, into products and services that have economic as well as social value. The economic is just one part. It's over, often overemphasized, but the social value of innovations are also uh, very important. And so these discoveries play a central role. And so it's really important not to be uh, sidetracked and to remember that um, we need, uh, we have to make new discoveries. And when you actually look at how these uh, discoveries are made, they're often made by, by serendipity. And what is serendipity? Well, it's a mindset. It's a mindset where if you step in the lab, you should be prepared uh, to, 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 see, to expect the unexpected, okay? Or as uh, Louis Pasteur uh, put it uh, very elegantly, is that chance favors the prepared minds, okay? So you need knowledge, of course, but knowledge is, uh, is not enough uh, mind, uh, discovery is really a, a, a mindset where you, you, you have to be prepared for the unexpected. Now, because you find the unexpected when you get into your clean room and you try to apply a process and things don't work out mm -hmm. the way uh, you expect they, they would, okay? There's a lot of uh, frustration. There's a lot of that unexpected component uh, adds to uh, the complexity. But that's where you also need to have an innovator mindset and uh, as uh, Churchill uh, is famous for a lot of quotes, but this is one that I think uh, reflects quite well what an innovator mindset is, is that you know, a pessimist sees the difficulty in every opportunity, an optimist sees an opportunity in every difficulty. So if your process doesn't really work out the way you expected, it's not necessarily a, a failure. It can be an opportunity and it can be the beginning of a new discovery. Okay. Ultimately, I think innovation is art, okay? Because if you apply a well-defined process, and if the person who wrote the recipe did a really good job, and you apply every single step of that process, and you get what you want, that's useful, but it's not really innovation, okay? It's not innovation because machines and robots are very good at doing this. And they will do that much better than even the brightest students uh, we have here at Georgia Tech. And so just going in the lab and repeating what other people have done is not necessarily what, what I think as scientists and engineers um, we, we should be doing. And so what makes the discovery and the innovation uh, possible is that um, emotional a relationship that we develop uh, with what we do, with our research, uh, with the samples we work with, okay? Uh, because that artistic component is based on um, humans' creative skills and uh, imagination. And without those, 
you can't discover new things and uh, you can't really uh, innovate. So I just wanted to make some of these, uh, share some of these thoughts with you. And then that slide actually now takes me into the core of what I want to share next, which has to do with the title and the topic of my talk, namely interfaces. Okay? And uh, you can see when you look at a box like this, there are two aspects. There is what's inside the box. So if you're developing new materials and you're processing these materials into new films and you want to optimize the physical properties such as charge transport in an organic semiconductor, you worry a lot and you should about what's in that film, what's the morphology of that film and uh, what's in there. So the inside is very important. But the outside is also very important and the outside are the interfaces that this material will form with adjacent layers, with uh, electrodes, with a package, with a barrier coating, and all these things ultimately, as we will see, will have a very important uh, impact on the performance of your device. And a lot of the devices in the field of organic electronics actually rely, of course, on having great materials with useful properties. But at the end, if you want to make something uh, that has high performance, it's at, at the device level, and at the device level, you need to worry about uh, interfaces. Okay? And so that brings me to uh, organic semiconductors. And uh, also, I think this is an example of uh, disruptive technology, even though organic semiconductors have been around for a long time and uh, they've been studied. But now we see this is now, you know, prime time of. Um, deployment of some of these materials in real-world applications. The most mature of them is in displays. Most of you probably own a cell phone that uh, has an active matrix organic light emitting diode display. And these are organic semiconductors that uh, emit light. And so the building blocks here are molecules. Okay? And with these molecules, you can form uh, these solids, either through solution processing techniques or by uh, vacuum uh, deposition. And again, the vacuum deposition techniques are not necessarily uh, implemented at vacuum levels that are 10 to minus 7 or 10 to minus 10. Uh, some of these vacuum techniques can be very low vacuum, so you know, uh, 10 to minus 2 and, and, and so on. So uh, very, very practical. And what's surprising is that you end up with something which is pretty messy compared to conventional inorganic semiconductors because these materials contain a lot of impurities, they contain a lot of defects compared to uh, if you take a, a silicon ingot and you look at the level of purity, purity and crystallinity, it's a different world. Okay? However, as you will see, uh, surprisingly, these films are pretty insensitive to some of these defects because even at the macroscopic level, uh, you'll find that that molecular property has a strong component. And then, of course, some physical properties that we measure on a macroscopic scale will depend on the morphology of these films. But uh, still, we can get charge transport and mobility values that are enough for a lot of these applications. And so the vision and where you know, this could be really a disruptive technology is that since the processing is done at room temperature because it's very defect uh, tolerant, uh, you can imagine coding this on a very large scale on various kinds of substrates, uh, plastic, metal sheet, and, 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 and so on. Uh, potentially low cost, but uh, the cost here is important in terms of the capex and the overall capital investment that it would take to code these materials on a large scale. Remind you, you know, right now uh, microprocessors are, have reached a level of performance which is just amazing, scaling, and you know, Moore's law over the last uh, 30 years. But uh, what's less known is what's often referred to as Moore's second law, which is that the cost of uh, these fabs uh, is growing exponentially also, and now uh, you know is in the in the billions of dollars. Why here? Um, the, 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 the hope and the vision is that you could do things with uh, fairly less uh, capital uh, investment. So next, I'd like to share 
examples of um, work that we've done and also again highlight the importance of interfaces and hopefully convince you that some of these building blocks here I chose three main category of devices because they all have different function. The first one, the function, main function is, is light emission, so for, for displays or solid state lighting, which I think is, is an important part because a lot of our electricity uh, is used in, uh, in lighting and so if we can develop more efficient light sources we can make uh, tremendous energy savings. And then uh, transistors, because transistors are the core building blocks, you can make circuits and, and build a lot of functionality in these devices. And then the third one is on the organic photovoltaics, which is for uh, power generation. So let's start with OLEDs. As I mentioned earlier, you know, the, this is an area that uh, people have studied for many years, but uh, in the past few years, things have really started to uh, evolve very fast, and there is a massive uh, industrial activity now and the markets for uh, these uh, for that technology in particular for small uh, uh, mobile displays and uh, also TVs and the cost of these TVs last year uh, you could uh, buy a prototype in Asia of an OLED TV the price tag was uh, $10,000 okay a year later it has come down now to about $3,000 and continues to drop. So it's, it's there. And these, of course, are uh, large area devices. And there will be more and more displays. I mean, uh, most probably OLED displays will, will become the technology of choice for displays, especially that it also has uh, many advantages in terms of power savings also. So, so, okay. so the seminal work here goes back to the mid-'80s. Uh, paper uh, by uh, Ching Tang and, and uh, Steve Van Slyke uh, was published in 87 and some of the patents were filed a little bit earlier and uh, you know uh, at the beginning when you started talking about uh, this technology for displays there were of course a lot of skeptics but now here we are uh, we have now uh, these devices and so what's attractive about the technology is that if you look at the cross section of a device uh, it can, it's fairly simple so typically uh, you have a transparent electrode, um, you, you, you deposit a few uh, semiconducting layers, one usually has a, uh, its function is to, to be a hole transport layer, uh, on the other side you inject electrons and then these holes and electrons uh, meet in that layer here, they generate excited states and the radiative recombination of these excited states leads to uh, light emission and uh, so you can use that for displays and, and solid state lighting. And so for a long time, a lot of the devices were built on that uh, ITO coded uh, anode at the bottom because uh, uh, it was glass and so it's transparent and the light can, can go through. But uh, the problem with that geometry is that, um, well, first of all, uh, most of the displays that we use also require a sophisticated backplane uh, where you have all the, the pixels that, con I mean, all the circuits that control the pixels, and so what you'd like to do to uh, to optimize the, um, you know, the pixel aperture ratio is to deposit the light emitting material on top of these circuits, and uh, so uh, have a top emitting structure rather than a bottom emitting structure where uh, some of the circuits can get in the way, and then um, the other advantage is that. Uh, if you don't have that glass substrate anymore and the light is coming uh, from the top, you, you avoid some uh, losses which are due to light trapping in that glass substrate through total internal reflection that usually limits the amount of light that uh, uh, goes uh, to, to the user. Okay. Now when you look at the current technology uh, that are used to drive these LEDs, also they are, most of them are based on uh, NMOS. So, uh, n-channel type uh, transistors and so if you want uh, to power the LED here and you want to control the current that goes through the LED through the control of the gate source voltage here you'd rather put the diode on this side between uh, uh, on the drain side rather than the, the source side and that requires also having a device where the diode is uh, inverted uh, or flipped where the, the cathode is, is actually at the, at the bottom. Okay? And so, for a long time, um, we tried various materials, various architectures, and we failed. We just couldn't get uh, inverted diodes uh, or bottom cathode diodes to work as well 
as some of the more conventional ones where you finished with uh, that uh, electron uh, injecting contact. And the reason for this is uh, one uh, widely used electron injection, injection contact is based on a combination of uh, lithium fluoride with uh, aluminum. And so traditionally this is at the top and so the sequence for deposition is that you first deposit lithium fluoride and then you deposit aluminum on top. And uh, this was tested uh, also when you inverse the sequence where you first deposit aluminum and then lithium fluoride and then with some of these early electron transport materials that were used by Kodak and it didn't work. And so for about 10-15 years people thought well this just doesn't work um, the other way around but uh, again the students gave it a try and uh, what they found is that if you use some other uh, electron transport materials it works actually very well and so you can make very efficient uh, top emitting bottom cathode uh, structures and uh, you can see the performance here of these devices. Uh, all you have to do is apply a, a few volts and uh, so on the left here you see the current versus voltage so typical diode a little bit of leakage here uh, and if you look at the correspondence luminance um, as a function of voltage you can see that uh, applied voltage of about uh, 6 volts you can get nearly 10,000 candelas per square meter. Okay? Now just to calibrate you, if you're not familiar with luminance units, the typical luminance of your uh, laptop or TV is, is about 500 to 700 candelas per square meter. So, you know, 10,000 candelas per square meter is a, is a very bright source. Okay? And the external quantum efficiency can be as high as 30% in these structures, uh, which is as good or in some cases even higher than what you can achieve in devices with a conventional geometry. So that's uh, one of the highest efficiency you can achieve in structures like this with a emitting, emitting layer that uh, it's fairly isotropic. And so the next thing was how can we further improve this? And uh, the answer is um, you know you build structures where you have multiple heterojunctions such that the current doesn't just flow through one diode but it flows through two diodes which means that at the same current you can get twice as much light. Of course the trade-off is that your applied voltage has to be doubled or larger because you have a thicker structure and uh, it makes the, the structure a little bit more complicated but uh, with the current uh, organic uh, multi-source deposition systems that uh, we use this is this is not too difficult and so here are the performance of these uh, multi-junction devices so again the key here was in, in being able to get these uh, uh, interfacial materials that lithium fluoride um, to be efficient electron injecting electrodes and likewise here that that compound here actually uh, in combination with uh, TAPC makes a very good uh, anode and here you can see that uh, the black curve are the luminance and uh, external quantum efficiency for a single junction device. If you stack and you make two, you can double and now you can get uh, even higher efficiency. And uh, here is a, a plot of the current efficacy uh, measured in candelas per amp. This is the relevant metric for display. And again, you double when you have uh, two junctions. And uh, if you optimize that device and you add a uh, thin layer here to improve the amount of light that's uh, extracted or minimizing some of the cavity effects here uh, in that structure. You can build structures or devices that have a current efficacy of 200 candelas per amp. Okay? And uh, at, uh, at the luminance of 100,000 candelas per square meter, you still keep uh, 100 candelas per amp. Okay? So that means you know, future displays and, and future light sources can be made very efficient with uh, these various materials and these various architectures. The second example uh, of uh, devices I'd like to uh, uh, describe has to do with organic field effect transistors. Okay? Uh, the transistor, I don't have to elaborate, most of you know is one of the core building blocks of uh, modern uh, microelectronics. And uh, so here is an example of uh, a transistor architecture that uh, my postdoc, Do Kyung uh, Wong, developed uh, a few years ago. And this is again kind of an example where um, serendipity 
had uh, an important uh, role. And uh, so the structure is shown here on the left. Uh, as a substrate, we use glass. We can use plastic. Uh, there is a little uh, uh, a passivation layer here uh, just to improve uh, adhesion on the glass. It's not very important. Then we first uh, deposit some metal electrodes. So these are the source and drain electrodes. Then uh, we spin coat a semiconductor, which is a mixture of that molecule in that polymer matrix. So this is processed from solution. And then the important part here, which is a little bit unusual, is the gate dielectric, which is comprised of that bilayer, uh, first a perfluorinated uh, polymer, and then a high K dielectric layer that is processed by atomic layer deposition. Okay? Initially, the motivation was to um, use Cytop, because Cytop uh, is a fluorinated material, and so it's soluble in solvents that are orthogonal to the solvents that are being used to process the organic semiconductor. So you can spin coat it on top without dissolving the semiconductor underneath. And more importantly, you get a very clean, very sharp interface between these two materials that are very different. Okay? And that's important in the operation of a transistor because I remind you the way the transistor operates here is that you have a conduction channel here at the semiconductor dielectric interface uh, that is modulated by the value of the gate voltage. So the more uh, voltage you apply to the gate, the more carriers you create in that channel and then current starts to flow here in that channel between the source and drain electrode. Okay? And so Cytop is great, but the problem is that these materials have a low dielectric constant. And so when you operate your transistor, uh, the operating voltage depends on the capacitance density of your gate dielectric. So you can either uh, increase the dielectric constant of your gate dielectric or make it very thin. Okay? The problem when you make it very thin is that you generally have leakage and so you don't get a very good transistor. And so in a way of uh, trying to remediate to that problem we said well uh, what if we instead of having just a si single cytoplayer we actually deposit a high K dielectric on top and uh, a, a defect free high K dielectric and this is what atomic layer deposition gets you. It gets you very conformal, uh, pinhole free, uh, uh, high quality films. And so even with uh, 50 nanometers, now you can get a very good, uh, um, very low leakage in, in these transistors. And so on the right hand side, you see the uh, uh, tr uh, transfer characteristic of that uh, uh, transistor. It's not the greatest shape here, um, but uh, mobility values typically of the order of one. And uh, you see operating voltages that are typically be, be below 10 volts. Okay, so we're pretty happy. And then the question, of course, that always comes up is how stable are these materials? So uh, Do Kyung went in the lab and he started testing these transistors uh, day after day, week after week. And uh, to his surprise, he always got exactly the same electrical characteristic. These samples were not degrading. It was very, very strange. So he, he started to do more detailed uh, uh, stress or lifetime tests. And so he first started to cycle these transistors. Okay? So you can see here transfer characteristics over 20,000 cycles. These are samples that are you know, kept in ambient conditions. There is no shift in the threshold voltage, which for, at the time for organic transistors was, was really unprecedented. But then he kind of looked at patients and he said, well, um, Ah, I don't know if that movie is playing. He, um, yeah, I don't have the source. But anyway, I can describe to you what the movie is, uh, is showing. He, he took the samples and uh, he put them in a plasma chamber. Okay? Plasma chamber, no protection, five minutes. And uh, he took the samples out, he put them back in the uh, semiconductor parameter analyzer. And he could still see a, a response. And then uh, he decided to take these samples and to, um, to put them in, uh, immerse them in water. And the transistor was still working. And so uh, here are uh, the, the, the detailed uh, results. So this is the transfer characteristic of a sample when it's uh, freshly uh, fabricated and it's kept in an inert atmosphere. It's never been exposed to uh, uh, the outside environment. If you expose it to air after a few days, you have a small change in the characteristics, but 
it, it saturates and it, it stabilizes. But here's the interesting part. So this is the transfer characteristic measured before and after a plasma treatment, five minutes in a plasma chamber. Uh, and you see there is uh, very little change. And of course, if you take reference samples where you have only the aluminum oxide or if you have just a cytop, uh, these samples are just fried, they don't work anymore. And this is before and after um, immersion in water for, for an hour, okay? So that shows you that, you know, organic uh, semiconductors can be made uh, very stable. It kind of depends on the structure uh, and how you, you, you fabricate and design that structure. And going back actually to, to the overall uh, geometry of that transistor, uh, what happens is that that combination of that uh, cytoplayer layer in addition to the aluminum uh, oxide layer deposited by ALD actually has a very good barrier property. So not only does it provide a nice gate dielectric, but it also protects or uh, it, it avoids that you have permeation of uh, uh, oxygen or moisture in, into the film. Mm -hmm and so it doesn't degrade and that's why these devices have such uh, long lifetimes. Now of course uh, when you make transistors by spin coding this is great, it's nice, it's a proof of principle but if you want to get uh, industry's interest you also have to show that it can be manufactured using some processes that are scalable and so one of them is inkjet printing. You can make you know very large area devices by inkjet printing so we took some of these transistors same geometry, slightly different ink inks this is a commercial ink that you can buy from uh, Polyera. Uh, this is a small molecule that can be processed from solution uh, that was made by our collaborators uh, in Seth Marder's group. And you can see here the corresponding uh, transfer characteristics of some of these transistors that uh, have been printed on a, on a plastic substrate with a printed the silver electrode, uh, inkjet printed semiconductor, and then uh, the, the gate dielectric on top and a printed uh, a top gate. Uh, this one I like very much because you can see this is a, a, a transistor that has nearly zero threshold voltage and now the transfer characteristic is very clean, has very little uh, uh, contact resistance and so uh, you know it shows that these devices not only stable and they don't just have uh, a per performance level that is comparable to amorphous silicon but they can be also they can be processed using um, techniques that are scalable and, and used in industry. Okay? And then of course, because we noticed that uh, these sensors are now so robust in aqueous uh, environment, you can immerse them in water, so we developed sensors with these uh, materials. And I don't have time to go into the details, but you can use them also for pH measurement. So, the last part um, of my talk I'd like to share with you some advances that we've made in the field of organic photovoltaics. And so here again, um, you know, with an emphasis on interfaces and, and how advances in interfaces can actually lead to uh, better devices with higher performance but also um, with uh, higher stability. And so if you look at the, the barriers for commercialization and some of the challenges of all these techniques is that they usually require uh, high work function and low work function electrodes. Okay? And uh, in an LED uh, it's relevant because you, you want to efficiently inject holes and ele efficiently inject electrons so that you can form these excited states and then have radiative recombination and light emission. In a photovoltaic cell uh, you want a large difference in the work function between the two electrodes because that determines your, your build-in potential and is an upper limit to the open circuit voltage or the photovoltage that you can get in, uh, in some of these materials. And so if you take the table of elements and you look at the different metals, uh, there are materials out there that have a very low work function, such as calcium or magnesium, but uh, because of their work function, low work function, they're also highly reactive, okay? And so making a high efficiency device with a calcium electrode is nice if you want to show uh, a new records in efficiency, but uh, you know, deploying cells that contain calcium is ne not necessarily um, the best approach. And so there was a need to try to develop uh, new materials or new techniques to avoid the use of uh, highly reactive electrodes such as calcium. And so let me share the next few minutes the process that uh, 
you know, discovery and, and the, the serendipity um, and, and how we came to, to uh, the development of, of some electrodes that I believe uh, work very well. And so this all started uh, through the work of uh, one of my graduate students, uh, Jay Wan uh, um, uh, Shim, who's now graduated, uh, is a job at, uh, at Samsung. And he was using TiO2 nanoparticles dispersed in water. And uh, TiO2 is a well-known electrode and uh, uh, he started using that polymer, PVP, because it's known to be a, a dispersant. Um, and so uh, it would improve the quality of these TiO2 films. And uh, as he shared the early results of the solar cells he had fabricated with these TiO2 um, um, layers, um, we, I asked him if he had kind of optimized the concentration of that surfactant, that dispersant, the PVP, and he said, no, but I'm going to do this. And so he came back and we looked at the data and he said, well, it's strange because the more surfactant I pour in there, the better the solar cells. I said, well, that's kind of strange. doesn't really make sense because that material is, is it's an insulator, right? So I said, well, have you tried just the surfactant itself? And he said, why would I do this? This is an insulator. It's, nothing's going to happen. I said, well, but how, how do we understand then uh, the properties of these cells? So very simple experiment. He took a dilute solution of PVP. He dipped it into the solution. And uh, we have a Kelvin probe set up in the lab, and he put the ITO modified with uh, that PVP under the Kelvin probe, and the work function dropped from 4.6 to 4.2 EV. Okay? Puzzling. We didn't really understand what was going on, but we trusted the Kelvin probe measurement. The work function really decreased. So this is where also an, another important part is that you can't do everything on your own. You need to collaborate. This is, this is really uh, uh, truly interdisciplinary field of research. And so we had uh, colleagues, collaborators, some on campus within COPE, uh, and others actually uh, at different institutions. And one of them was Antoine Kahn at uh, Princeton, who's an expert in photoemission spectroscopy. And uh, we called him up and said, OK, here is what we've, we've seen. And uh, you're interested? They said, yeah, just send me a little bit of PVP, and we'll stick uh, ITO modified um, sample into my uh, UPS setup and we'll see what happens. And this is what he measured. Uh, basically, uh, these on the left here is, is the onset of the secondary photoelectrons um, uh, of uh, um, a UPS experiment. And you can see that the bare ITO, that onset is at this energy and once you put PVP on top, you have that shift here, which is an indication of uh, corresponding shift of the vacuum level, which can be understood by the formation of a surface dipole. Okay? So now we started to understand what was causing the change in work function. And then we went back and talked to our colleagues uh, who are chemists and said, well, what could possibly be happening here? And uh, of course, one suspect was that uh, this is an amide here, but uh, that uh, nitrogen, uh, which has uh, donating uh, properties. and so. Uh, we started to hypothesize and then we went and we picked the Aldrich catalog, which is kind of the Bible for chemists where you have all these compounds. And we started looking for compounds that contain a lot of amines. Okay? And uh, we ordered like uh, a dozen. And uh, among these materials, we had these uh, uh, materials that are shown here. So these branched uh, uh, materials containing a lot of amines. We call it PIE or this one is, is PEI. And we started doing the same thing. We just dipped uh, ITO electrodes into that solution, measured changes with the Kelvin probe, sent them to Princeton. They measured uh, the shifts of the vacuum levels. But now these shifts are not just tens of EVs. The shift was huge, uh, over a volt. Okay? And what the data show here also is that it doesn't just work on ITO, but you can do the same with gold. You take gold, which is a very stable, high work function electrode, you dip it into a dilute solution of that material, and zoom, you end up with something which has a work function which is one and a half volt lower. Okay? So you can turn stable high work function electrodes into low work function electrodes with uh, values that are actually comparable to, to some of these uh, uh, very uh, unstable materials. The other nice part also is that on the top here, you see pH 1000, this is the, 
the name of a conducting polymer, P dot PSS. So this is a plastic electrode, so you can apply the same strategy on an organic electrode. And so here are the data. You can see that if you take ITO, you uh, treat it with PIE, the work function drops from about 4.7 down to 3.6. It's stable as a function of temperature for temperatures up to 200 degrees C, which is plenty because uh, these are the typical uh, temperature ranges that we use uh, when we work with organic semiconductors. And if you look at the environmental stability, if you expose these films to air, thousands of hours, uh, you have very little change in the work function. So very good uh, stability. So the first step was, of course, to validate that the change in work function and the ability to produce low work function uh, electrodes was working in solar cells. So here's on the left a typical architecture here, test structures, glass, ITO, which typically is used as a whole collecting electrode. But if you modify it with that amine containing polymer, it becomes a low work function electrode. So it becomes um, an electron collecting electrode, then an active layer, uh, top uh, hole collecting electrode here, molyoxide silver, and makes fairly nice uh, solar cells with power conversion efficiencies larger than, than, than 6%. But remember the part that uh, was also uh, surprising was the fact that we could change the work function of conducting polymers. Now conducting polymers such as P.PSS are usually known as uh, they are, they are P-doped and they have uh, high work function uh, values. Okay? But now here with uh, the possibility to uh, reduce the work function of these conducting polymers, we had high work function and low work function conducting polymers which means that we were able to fabricate a completely plastic solar cell. So substrate is plastic. The electron collecting electrode is that modified P dot PSS, low work function conducting polymer. You uh, spin coat uh, the active layer on top and uh, you spin coat another uh, high work function uh, electrode. And uh, so all, all plastic cell, the details are shown here. Efficiencies are comparable uh, to devices on glass with uh, metal electrodes, maybe a little bit less because of uh, uh, more series resistance, but uh, that can be, these are details that can be optimized. Okay. So initially, the cells were fabricated using spin coding, but uh, spin coding P dot PSS on top of an uh, active layer that's processed from a chlorinated uh, a typical organic solvent was a little bit challenging. And so, again, in collaboration with uh, people at Princeton, we started to look for other uh, ways of fabricating these cells rather than uh, coding. And one of them was uh, transfer lamination, dry transfer, which is you know, something that's, that's used a lot in, in, in the industry. And uh, so in the next example that I'm showing you here, um, we started with a low work function bottom electrode. But then the active layer, rather than being spin coated, was first fabricated on an independent substrate, kind of a stamp, and then was transferred onto the substrate and the electrode. And then the, the top electrode here, the, the top uh, P dot PSS dash L, L here means that these are dry transfer laminated layers, was transferred on top. And uh, we can make uh, solar cells that uh, not only operate very well, but with unprecedented dynamic range. Okay? Nowadays, if you take even the commercial silicon solar cells, they operate very well under, uh, in outdoor applications under bright sun condition or diffuse light, but you need fairly high injections. You need uh, a high insulation because um, when you, the way the cells are fabricated, when you put, you put the grids and the electrodes, you introduce some defects. And so you have what's called a parasitic resistance and a low shunt resistance. And that low shunt resistance actually limits the performance of these solar cells under low light level. This is why it's difficult to make solar cells that actually uh, convert uh, light in indoors application into, into power. Okay. But because of the transfer lamination of these films, and a corresponding reduction in defects, we could get cells that have very high shunt resistance in the 100 mega ohm square centimeter, which is uh, you know, 10,000 times higher than what we were typically measuring in conventional cells, which means that we could fabricate now solar cells that actually operate from a full 
sun conditions at one sun over six orders of magnitude. Okay, so you take a, a neutral density filter, OD1, okay, that reduces your incident light by, by 10%, okay, one order of magnitude. You stack six filters like this. You have to work really hard to get to the conditions where you have that uh, little light in your lab and, and you still get uh, open circuit voltage of the order of uh, uh, 0.2 in, uh, in these cells. And so here you can see the photovoltaic dynamic range when the light level is varied by uh, uh, six orders of magnitude. We've recently taken some of these samples and we evaluated their performance as photodetectors and I can't give you the details because we've yet to file patents and so on. But we have shown that these devices can have a linear dynamic range of 10 orders of magnitude, which means that they are better than some of the best silicon photodiodes that are available. Okay, so stay tuned. Anyway, so uh, the way you can improve the performance of uh, light emitting diodes is making multi-junction devices. The same is true here with organic solar cells. So you can make uh, stacks where uh, you can connect these, cel these cells uh, in series and the advantage is that you, you, know, you, you can add up the, the voltages and you can harvest different parts of the spectrum if you use materials that have different uh, optical properties. And here again, that uh, amine containing polymer as a surface modifier uh, turned out to be a very good uh, process to uh, develop these uh, interconnection layers that connect these two cells. So uh, going back to the previous architecture, you see here the challenge is in that layer here, the so-called charge recombination layer that connects these two cells. You don't want to introduce optical losses. You don't want to introduce resistive um, so, so resist, series resistance. And, and so here, we could do this by having just a very thin conducting polymer layer that on one interface is modified by that amine containing material. And if you combine these two layers, you can get now tandem cells uh, with efficiencies higher than 8% and, and fill factors that are beyond 70%. Uh, Okay, this is the, the record champion cell, but it's not, not really important. So this is a summary of, um, uh, you know, that, that technique. It shows that it's, it's really universal uh, in, in, in the fact that it works uh, with a very broad um, uh, range of uh, different electrodes from uh, uh, metals to conducting polymers to various oxides, even graphene. Okay, and so next next few minutes, I'd like to also uh, share with you kind of a small step of something which I think will become more and more important. It's just kind of uh, stimulate your, your intellect and, and I think uh, get us thinking more about uh, full life cycle assessment in everything that we do. Because if you look at today's use of energy, uh, there's residential use, there's commercial use, but a lot of energy is used at the industrial scale. And so how much energy is actually used to produce something for the whole life cycle of the product, including the recycling, I think needs to be uh, evaluated when we compare different uh, technologies and not just uh, a metric which is like the dollars per watt at the module level when we compare different PV technologies. Okay? So the carbon footprint until now was irrelevant, but I think it's becoming center stage. And so we really need to worry about the environmental footprint of what we do and how much energy is actually used to produce these things. Uh, just, you know, in parenthesis, it's interesting when you start looking at uh, the full life cycle assessment of existing legacy technologies such as silicon, crystalline silicon. You know, these make very nice cells and, and crystalline silicon is great. There's nothing wrong with deploying more PV based on silicon. But if you look in the long term in terms of sustainability, and you think about how much energy is used to produce these silicon ingots and how much energy is produced to dope these materials at very high temperatures and the ease at which you can actually make these new materials and dope them. Doping is just mixing two compounds at room temperature compared to you know, heating things up at a thousand degrees for, for minutes or hours. Okay? And so this is um, work that uh, we did a few years ago and 
after we published uh, the, our work on the all plastic solar cell in science, it received uh, uh, some publicity and, and people started to call me up and say, what are you thinking? You want to make plastic solar cells, but plastics are horrible. They are, you know, they are uh, at the origin of uh, the pollution of oceans and so on. So why would you want to massively deploy uh, more plastics and, and basically try to solve an environmental problem by, by creating another one, okay? So that uh, mm, was kind of uh, um, uh, a good uh, stimulation. And we started thinking about, well, what could we possibly do to further reduce the footprint of uh, some of these solar cells? And so if you look at the cross-section of these cells right now, the active layers are very thin, typically 100, 200 nanometers, okay? So to what makes most of the cell is actually the substrate because you need something that has the mechanical properties so that you can manufacture it and, and, and handle it, deploy it. And so we thought, well, can we actually replace some of these synthetic uh, plastic substrates with natural materials? And uh, this is where, uh, again, by serendipity, I learned about uh, uh, cellulose nanocrystals at, uh, at a dinner that uh, the IPST um, had organized uh, two years ago, and I learned about these materials and you start from wood and uh, you know all that process down here where you have these fibers is, is well known because this is the, the, the pulp that we use to produce paper. Okay? But if you go further and you, 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 you continue to break down uh, the paper pulp into the smallest substituents, you can uh, fabricate these cellulose nanocrystals and uh, you can make transparent, optically transparent substrates uh, from these materials. And so we uh, fabricated uh, solar cells on these uh, CNC substrates. And uh, w because they are made from these very small constituents, you can make surfaces which are very smooth, very planar, much smoother than paper. If you try to pa on paper, it's very difficult because the paper is too rough to fabricate these uh, organic structures. And so we could make cells at the time of uh, power conversion efficiency of about 3%. Well, but what's really interesting is the ease at which you can actually recycle uh, or recover uh, these uh, solar cells fabricated on the CN CNC um, substrate. And so here's a little movie uh, that shows that you know, within 10 minutes uh, or less if you, if you steer and shake, the substrate, uh, the nanocellulose substrate, dissolves in water at room temperature. If you uh, filter it out, you can separate the, the, the cellulose that's in the solvent from uh, the, uh, the organic material that uh, uh, absorbs the light. And then if you wash the, what's left, you can see that uh, it changes color. And the color here is because you're dissolving the active layer uh, that uh, is used uh, in the solar cell. And so you can recover uh, the active polymer in another solvent and then at the end, you can also recover some of the metal nanoparticles uh, coming from the electrode. So within a few minutes uh, at room temperature, you can take these cells and you can, you can uh, separate them in their uh, constituents, okay? And so this is just a recent work we've done in uh, using that uh, transfer lamination so that now uh, we can have higher efficiencies of the order of 4%. And also recently we've shown that you can fabricate light sources. You can make organic light emitting diodes on some of these uh, substrates. So basically improved paper, okay? All right, so that brings me uh, to my last slide. Um, I don't really have a conclusion because I think this is all work in progress. I hope I convinced you that uh, you know, these are small steps. Uh, they are still, there's still plenty of room for additional uh, science, engineering, and, uh, and uh, innovation. And so uh, before I end, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the students, uh, postdocs, past the students and postdocs who've, and collaborators who've uh, uh, worked and, and made some of these results uh, possible. Without them, uh, none of what I was showing today would have been possible. And so with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention.
CHT uh, PCBM mixtures, the phase separation was uh, really important to maintain the integrity of the charge transport. When you're going from like 10 nanometers to 200 nanometers in thickness for the PCBM or uh, the P3HT PCBM or equivalent layers, how are you in laminate, how are you maintaining phase separation sufficiently to get good charge transport from the middle of the cell out to the edges? I mean, because you want phase mixing, right? Well, you're right. The morphology and the control of the morphology are very critical in many aspects. Okay, but you can either do that in situ, in a cell where you fabricated the layer um, by conventional, uh, you know, all additive spin coating, or you can do the same uh, processing in the film before you transfer it. Okay, and so the transfer itself, I guess, the the, the limitations with the transfer is that um, not all materials are transferable with the same ease because it depends on the, the softness or the, the level of crystallinity of some of these layers. So that has to be you know, tuned a little bit. I don't want to imply that the transfer lamination is, is straightforward. It's, it's sometimes a little bit tricky. But at least uh, this is proof of principle that it can be done. And we get one more question. Uh, Bernard, uh, this is about the idea of creating a different work function layer, so then stacking them in order to get a whole work function metal at the end. Uh, it's thermodynamically impossible. And the reason is that you can certainly make a layer and coat it with something, and you can get a different value of work function as measured by Kelvin probe by, by XPS. But once you, once you contact it with another layer, of a different work function, then the uh, and the charge is transferred between the two interfaces, then it cancels out. And it's just always the first layer and the last layer which actually will give you the total work function yeah. difference, but nothing in between makes any difference. Well, it's a good point. Things are a little bit more complicated that, than what I implied. And so what um, what happens also, and, and you know, we, we've, we've shown that in our paper, is that at the interface, once you put um, the semiconductor in contact with the low work function electrode after the modification, you have doping at that interface of the semiconductor. And that also contributes to higher uh, and efficient injection. I mean, the injection is, you know, you'll see it in, in every single diode where you do that modification. It's a proven, very efficient way of injecting uh, electrons, which you can describe as a lower effective barrier. Okay, but you're right. What really matters is the combination of the electrode with the semiconductor that you put on top, uh, and then it's it's that effective barrier for charge injection, and it's not just the work function of the material that matters, but there's also uh, there are, you know, physical processes happening in the semiconductor itself once you make the contact, and so that's you that's the critical what part. You said is the efficiency, uh, because anything that is at the interface will affect the kinetics of the charge transfer, but not the thermodynamics. When you are transferring charge from bulk to bulk to bulk to bulk, the interfaces do not matter. You can make it slower. So this is why on your P injunctions you see a different response curve. So what, the, and the reason well, that you are apparently seeing a, uh, a, a difference in the light is that you have an inadvertent capacitance in, at the interfaces. They are not ideal interfaces. But as long as the charge can transfer across, it doesn't matter. Thermodynamics is always the same. Well, but what you see is that, you know, the, the applied voltage is significantly reduced. And you have a capacitor there, which you do not know about. Maybe it works. Okay, let's thank uh, Professor Kaplan again.